Hey, this is Scott from Pray5.org. It's Thursday, uh, the 19th. <laughs> uh, tonight we're going to be studying on the next to the last chapter of the book of John, finally finishing this one up. Uh, next week we'll finish up, obviously, on chapter 21. And then what we'll do is we will uh, start Hebrews the following week. Um, some things I want to get uh, to kind of uh, get started with. Y'all been watching the news. Uh, I've had it said to me in a loving way. Uh, I've got a thick skin that I like to focus on uh, conspiracy theories and, and stuff like that. And it's like, well, when the Bible tells us prophecy, which the Bible is, you know, almost 31% prophecy, so almost a third prophecy. And uh, the prophecies that are happening now, uh, God himself is the one who spoke at Jesus. Uh, Yeshua said in, in Matthew and uh, in uh, Corinthians, uh, it was repeated about what was going to happen during these times. And in Revelation, he says... Uh, you know, when John recorded what he what he was told uh, by Jesus, um, and this is after this is in 94, 95 A.D. Uh, when when Jesus spoke to him from the throne room. Uh, if you haven't read Revelation, it's a really interesting interesting book. Uh, it's a if you go to Daniel and Revelation, they're bookends. Um, so the, the thing is, the reason why I like to go with prophecy is because if you're seeing prophecy being fulfilled that he talked about long before it ever happened, well, then that gives credence and authenticity to the scriptures. Just to me, that makes common sense. So if you're seeing something, you say, well, you don't need to be focusing on that because we already know what's going to happen. Well, if you're knowing that something's getting ready to happen or events, uh, whether it be natural or war or whatever, you should, I feel like you should point it out because, again, it shows the authenticity. It prepares people. And to say, well, we're, that's not for us, well, that's not true. We're not going to go through the tribulation. If you're a believer, you're not going to go through the tribulation. But we don't know how close we're going to get to the heat. In other words, the way my mama used to say uh, is that we may not be in the fire, but we, we will feel the warmth. <laughs> we will feel the heat. And so far right now, that's what we're feeling, the birth pains. Um, and it could, no one knows the day or the hour of the rapture. But if you're in the tribulation, you will know the exact day, hour, location, and season of where the, the second return of Christ, because it says so. Um, but you won't know the rapture. No one knows. Um, I'm going to put on a few, let me see. I'm going to probably put four. Um, I look back here because I, I wrote that up on the board to remind myself. Olive Tree Ministries. Uh, and, you'll, and I'll post a picture up here uh, when I get this edited. There will be two videos. One is the, um, the disappearing, which is the rapture. That's the one where they're going over uh, Scripture as far as what prophecies have been fulfilled. Nothing has to be fulfilled to, uh, for Christ to come back. It's, everything's on the scene. Doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow, okay? But it doesn't mean it won't happen, so we, we just don't know. Don't worry about it. Just continue to spread the gospel as if it was tomorrow. Live your life as if it was tomorrow. Keep putting in your 401k and being diligent with your finances for your retirement also, okay? That way you're, when he comes back, he'll find you either in death or the rapture. He'll find you working and doing, uh, serving him. Uh, the next one on Olive Tree is The Deception. This one is a little creepy. When I mean creepy, not a bad creepy, <laughs> not, but kind of scary. Uh, if you're familiar with a guy by the name of Klaus Schwab, not the Schwab investments you see, the Charles Schwab, but Klaus Schwab. He's a German. Uh, he has a an Israeli right-hand man. He's a, he's a scientist. Um, and I'll put all that information up here. He is anti-God, hates God. And he he says it, it, he's wanting to be able to put, to hack the human brain to where 
He says, volition is a waste of time. Volition is, is a myth. Uh, volition choices, he says, it's just a chemical reaction is all it is. And we, being him and the elites, are saying that they should be the ones to put something in your body, in your skin, to be able to control your thoughts. He says, Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ is fake news. We'll, put, we'll give you something. We'll hack your, your system to make it easier on you to where you won't accept fake news. His words. The deception that's in that one, and you're thinking, there's no way this guy actually said this. And you sit there and you, it'll show, it'll go from audio with a still picture to video with clips and everything. It's about an hour and six minutes long. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. Why should we be aware? Is just like if you know, hey, there's a, there's a, a wild animal coming into your house. We'll say, well, I know it's coming to my house. Like we can ignore it and just go on doing our business. No, be prepared in case the animal makes it into your home. Well, we don't know how long we're going to be here. Uh, use common sense. You don't have to worry. You don't have to have anxiety because Christ is in control. But he tells us to use common sense. In other words, um, to have a little extra be prepared for like natural disasters a little bit keep extra food and medicines and, and extra cash in the house or whatever but not depend on that for your security because that's not that's not what he he said now I've, I've seen the other spectrum where people would go overboard and they start building bomb shelters and their thing trying to live out the seven-year tribulation well if you're saved you're not going to be there or to the other extreme saying well we'll just we'll trust on the lord and you know, he'll, he'll provide for us, which he says he will. But he says, I provide you the information before the event. Look in, look in the Bible. Every time when, when God was getting ready to do something, even to the pagans, he would send a prophet or he'd send somebody to tell them, hey, I'm getting ready to destroy your city. I'm getting ready to uh, destroy it. The, the one that had the least amount that I remember is uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. They were they were destroyed because they you know to, after they got Lot his his daughters and wife out, but the angels came in and said the Lord's going to destroy this place, get out. Um, but God comes in and says change, tries to give warnings. Well, if you're not watching, you know the new the Bible is telling us what's, why are things happening, and then it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. We're not going back the way things were. You say, well, that's a tinfoil hat. Well, you might want to grab some tinfoil and put one on because it's happening. If even the even my liberal friends, you know, yes, I do have some friends that, you know, they have the right to be wrong. Um, the thing is, they're even seeing the, the effects of what's going on. And some of them are not believers. Uh, and they don't, they're, they're like, well, we can see something going on. So, well, yeah, that's, and the more that you can show like, for instance, prophecy is my favorite thing as far as I can't prophesy anything, nothing, zero. Don't believe me, ask my wife. <laughs> but, the th but what you can do is you can read the prophecies that God wrote down in here. And you don't have to be a prophet to read that. Just know how to read it and study it and discern what it is. Because if you say it or somebody else says it, it's going to be the same thing. Okay? The other videos are Jack Hibbs. Um, real life ministries um and he's gonna be speaking on hell because remember christ spoke on hell 46 times and he said those are going that hell was made for satan and his angels his demons it was it wouldn't it wasn't produced for for humans <coughs> excuse me uh he said it wouldn't it wouldn't created for humans and he said it, he said but humans go there those who don't accept him so people say well god wouldn't send somebody to a to an eternal lake of fire he says he will he's going to um anyway jack gibbs it's a that's a short one it's about 20 minutes long again i'm gonna put all the, i don't know which order i'm gonna put them in here i'll put them up here each as i'm speaking and i'll leave them up long enough we can write, jot down the information um also with uh, there's a G3, G is in George, the number three, uh, interview with Paul Washer. Uh, Paul Washer 
is a no, no nonsense, no frills kind of teacher. Excellent pastor. Uh, he, he doesn't beat around the bush. Uh, I guess I like him because he, uh, uh, a pattern after that, I guess, a little bit. Um, but he is explaining on, there's so many people out here that think they're saved because they either go to church or because they just believe in Jesus or said the sinner's prayer. To getting saved is not rocket science. Can't be, or we'd all be in trouble. It's a free gift. Um, but what we see is people say, oh, I got saved at a concert or, or Billy Graham crusade or wherever, but nothing changed. There's no, you can't tell the difference between the time they walked in to the time they walked out, their life is exactly the same. Uh, same language, same actions. Um, and he goes into detail about that and it makes you think. If you're, you don't, to have basic understanding of who Jesus is and what he did for us, to accept what he did for us on the cross, that's what you need, okay? It, it's, it's on the level where anybody can understand whether you be you know, college educated or, or, or not. He made it for, so that anybody could understand the simple message, the gospel. Okay, let's go ahead and pray in, and we'll get into, like I say, John chapter 20, okay? Father, thank you for this time together, your blessings, your mercy, and your grace. We ask that you would show us through your Holy Spirit what it is that you're, you want us to, to know. Give me the words to speak and the words to hear. We ask for all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, in his name, amen. Okay, like I say, in verse 20, chapter 1, this is... If you remember last week uh, when Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb, which that's uh, that's prophecy. It was Joseph of Arimathea. And Nicodemus, the other Pharisee, the other of the ruling council, both did this. These, these two men of the council knew Torah, knew the Bible, the, what we call the Old Testament, and believed. And so they, were, they became... Uh, one of the first Christians, or the, actually it was called the way. Uh, Christians, when people started calling people little Christians, it was a derogatory term because they were trying to be mean and it stuck. We took it, we took it to heart. Well, anyway, Christ gets put in this tomb, okay? Well, now it's been the time he's been in the tomb for three days, not, not, not sat or part of Friday and all day Saturday and a few hours on Sunday. That's not three days. Uh, three days as he went in before sundown on Wednesday because then it was Thursday. So he spent all day Thursday, which was, remember, uh, Thursday. The, on This was the, the, uh, the high holy Sabbath because it was only once a week or once a year. And the day before, or when they put, took him off the cross, put him in, the, in the, his grave, by sundown, it was Thursday. That was a high holy Sabbath. And that only happens once a year, every year. Okay. So they couldn't do anything. The, the women couldn't do anything to, to go uh, prepare him or anything. The next day, remember we talked about last week, was preparation day, which was Friday. So good Friday is actually good Wednesday. So then you had Saturday, which was the normal Sabbath. You can't do any work on that day either. So there's two days during that week that they had to, they had to rest. Um, and then Sunday morning, which would be the first day of the week, that's when they went to go ahead, and that's when they found Christ alive. Let's read about it. This is, this is the good part. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. First day of the week was Sunday morning. While it was still dark, and she, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb, then she ran and came to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who is that? That's John. That's Again, that's the book we're reading. John the Revelator, not, not John the Baptist. And said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Nor she's under the impression that this was the body was stolen. And she did not remember. I mean, she he told them, Hey, I will raise again in three days. But he, he also told them that, he wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't understand this, okay, until afterwards. Of course, afterwards, yeah, then they then they were given the, 
<coughs> they were given the information. Okay. Verse 3, it said, Then Peter uh, therefore went out and with the other disciple, that would be John, and they were going, they were going to the, and, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together. The other disciple outran Peter. So John was younger, and he he beat him there because he's in better shape, better runner. Outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw that the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. The linen cloths, remember we are talking about this. There's a term that some people call this, and they say that they have this cloth. Whether they do or don't, I don't know. Um, it's called the Shroud of Turin, T-U-R-I-N. And whether it's authentic or not, I can't tell you. I've never seen the real one. I've seen copies. So is it possible they could have the Shroud of Turin? Sure. Is it um, something that should be worshipped or uh, considered, you know, as high as Scripture? No. It should be a, if it is in existence, it should be a piece of evidence verifying the Scriptures. Okay. But John did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, or he came brought up the rear, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief, remember we talked about this last week, and I'm getting ready to explain it again. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, no, it, was, it was separated, but it was folded together in a place by itself. Remember, uh, we, we spoke about last week, the people say, well, that's this is your opinion, but <clears throat> there's a lot of people with this opinion. Um, there, I went a little deeper into the study of the handkerchief. Handkerchief doesn't necessarily mean, uh, or uh, not handkerchief, uh, the, yeah, handkerchief. Um, didn't necessarily mean something that's used during the supper, but it, but, but it does get used during supper. That's the name of that the handkerchief we have or the napkin. Um, one of the studies shows that in the, I want to say third or fourth century, is that, uh, and you can Google this, you know, Google history of the napkin, history of, of, that covered Jesus' face, where'd it come from? And you'll get, a, you'll get several different articles and several different opinions, but they, they, they kind of all say the same thing. One is, is that if the king, he, when he would get, or the, the rich man, if he had a servant, the servant would stand off to the back when, when, the, when the, the uh, master was eating. He would stand, just stand out just out of sight and he'd keep an eye on the plate. So if he needed something, he would go over there and take care of it. Well, if the master got up, the, the, whoever the head of the household was that the servant was working for, and he just took his napkin and just threw it on the plate, that means He'd walk off, and that means I'm finished. I'm not coming back. But remember what we talked about before. If he folds it and just lays it down on the, on the beside the plate, not on top of it, but lays it down beside it, that's a sign to the servant, oh, he's, he's coming back. I'm, I'm coming back. I'm just going to go. I got something to do. I'll come right back. Don't touch it. <clears throat> so that's what they, that was one of the things. And that's not, I don't think it's done by accident. If you'll notice, the clothing that, or the wrap that he had was totally different. And the Bible makes it specific that one's folded, one's just tossed there. Well, his resurrection body doesn't need death clothes anymore. The napkin is a symbol to us that he's not finished. He's already died. That's why the clothes were wrapped up and thrown off in the corner or, or laid down. They weren't, they weren't folded. It was saying they were taught or separated. Two different events. One is finished. This one is, I'm coming back. That's the hope that we have as, as Christians, is because um, he's coming back to come get us. The thing is, and there is a rapture. The rapture is going to be a pre trib rapture. The reason why is because um, no one knows the hour or the day of the, of the coming uh, of, of the rapture. It says that in, in uh, both Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, Matthew 24, Luke, or Mark 13, and Luke 21. And it says no one knows the hour of the day. 
Not even the, not even while Christ was on earth did he know his human side. So anybody that says, oh, I know when it's coming, they're, they're saying they know more than Christ. That's, it. That's impossible. Get away, run, run from those people. They're false teachers. The... But the thing is, if you're in the tribulation, you're going to know that, like I say, according to Daniel 9, 27, Zechariah chapter 14, you're going to know the hour, the day, the location, and the season. So it means it can't be a mid- or a post-trib rapture. Is this worth arguing over, and is it a salvation issue? No. But it, it's but if, someone, if someone says, well, that's what the Bible says, well, then you can you can show Old and New Testament that it says differently. Even Jesus spoke about that in Matthew 25. Uh, Matthew 20, uh, yeah, Matthew 24. Verse 8, it says, Then the, outer, the other disciple who came to the tomb first, that would be John, went in also and saw and believed. In other words, they'd already heard this. For as of yet, they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Okay, he told them, I got to be raised up and I'll be re I'll stay there three days and I'll come back. Just like Jonah spent three days in the, in the uh, big fish. He said, I, that's, I've got to do this. And he didn't let them understand this. He did it on purpose. But when he saw this, then the, it clicks. It clicks with them. Because then I said, he must, it says, for as of yet, they did not know this, know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes, which are going, some, you know, they're scared. But Mary, this is Mary Magdalene, stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she, she uh, stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at, one, at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Let's not jump over this too quick. I have done this once before where I explained why is, it, why is this kind of important? The two angels are cherubim. You say, well, how do you get that? Okay. You know what the Ark of the Covenant is? You can go to the study Ark of the Covenant. Go to the pray5.org website and type in Ark. Not the Ark of the of Noah, but Ark, the Ark of the Covenant of uh, Moses or of Aaron. The Ark of the Covenant, when it was, it was God told the the, the craftsmen what to, how to build it exactly. They were dwelt by the Holy Spirit, and gi are giving them supernatural understanding of how to build this thing to its minute details. Why? Because there's the real one. This was a represent a, a, a replica of the one that's in heaven. Because we see in Revelation, where the Ark of the Covenant is in heaven, and I'll put the I'll put the verse up here on the on, for this service also. The um, the 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 Ark of the Covenant in heaven is the real one, obviously that sits in front of the Father. Jesus went up to the heaven after his dad when he ascended. He said when he told Mary, he said, "Don't touch me, for I not have yet ascended to my Father." He went up there and he sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat. They're completing the covenant. Okay. The mercy seat had to have the blood of the of the, the sacrifice. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Was the only one that could pay for sins of the entire world. The animals can only do it for one year at a time. And only for the Jewish people. For Israel. So... The mercy seat where God's blood is was covered with two cherubim guarding the mercy seat, one on one side and one on the other. Just like you see on uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's a pretty good representation of what we see written on how they built it, the size. And what, you know, it says the cherubim, they had their wings, were covering their face, and they were looking, you know, they were looking at the, at the mercy seat. Christ was the mercy seat. The slab he was laying on, you had an, a cherubim on one end, a cherubim on the other end. It wasn't just because they were just, hey, that's just a good place to sit. God does, doesn't do anything without a reason and without a purpose. These are, and you look at the scholars are in agreement here. These were cherubim guarding the mercy seat where Christ had shed his, he'd shed his blood on the cross 
but where the where the sacrifice was until he left, they were guarding that mercy seat. And he went up to the one in front of the Father. That's what we have. And there is no such thing as little fat baby angels. Um, anywhere in Scripture, uh, when we see angels being referred to, it's masculine, and they're they're not children. When you die, you don't you don't grow wings. Uh, there's very few places that talk about angels having wings. Um, and the scripture never says that we become angels when we die. Uh, we become something more um, if, you, if you're in heaven. So therefore, angels and humans are different, and they will be for eternity, okay? I'll do another study on that one day. Verse 14, now when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And then Jesus, Yeshua said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? He can read her mind. He's, he's not doing it for his benefit. He's doing it for hers and for ours because we're reading it. And she supposed him to be the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where he is, where you have where you have laid him, and I will go, I will go take him away. In other words, I'll bring him back. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around again and and said to him, Rabboni, which means you have three different kinds of, ra Rabboni means teacher, but you have rabbi and you have two other versions, but Rabboni means like, for instance, a master rabbi, a, the head, not just a, like you have in, in, a, in a synagogue, you have the rabbi, and then you have the chief rabbi, then you have the rabbi who's over everybody. Okay, that's what this referring to is, is Rabboni. You have Rob, Rabbi, Rabboni. Okay, this is the highest one. Verse 17, And Jesus, Yeshua said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. This is when he's going up to put the blood on the mercy seat in front of the Father. But go to my brethren, my brothers, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and to your God. Okay, Here's a, here's a point of contradiction that people use. Uh-oh, Christ is calling the Father his God. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if Christ is God, how can, he call, how can he call God the Father God? Hold your place right there. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Let's see if I can get that. Hebrews chapter 1, and we're going to go through the first eight verses real quick. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in, in, time, in time past to the fathers by the prophets, and has in these last days spoken to his Son, that's Jesus, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Christ is the creator. God the Father just said that who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had, let, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, this is interacting. You're saying, well, it's talking about God the Father and God the Son back and forth. Well, we know this is Christ because he's sitting down at the right hand of the Father. Remember, in like in in Romans, where it says, "No one," has, or excuse me, John chapter one verse eighteen. John chapter one verse eighteen says, "No one has seen the face of God, Him who is at the right is, is at the right hand of the Father." That's Jesus. Yeah, we. And you say, well, "Wait a minute." Go back to that study. Is Christ God on the Pray Five Dog Org website? And then I'll explain it. Verse four, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Okay, people, before, don't jump ahead. Don't jump ahead, please. This is saying, oh, he became above the angels. He got a name above the angels. Did he, if he's God, that means he had a name above the angels before he created them, so therefore there's a contradiction here. Keep reading. Verse 5, for which of the angels did he, ever, did God, ever say, you are my son, that's uppercase, and my is uppercase. So, so you can read it like this. 
who have I ever said that you are my father's son? Today I, the father, have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father. In other words, and he shall be to me a son. This is not lowercase s, this is uppercase. In other words, who of you are going to be, be my equal? Verse 6. But when he, as God the Father, again brings the firstborn. That's, firstborn is not he was just born. Firstborn is a title of authority. Again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he, God the Father, says, let all the angels of God worship him. You can only worship God. We see that twice in the Old Testament. We see Jesus saying in the desert when, when he was tempted for 40 days, the, the devil came and says, if you'll just fall and worship me, I'll give you all the world. He says, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord thy God only. God the Father just said to the angels, who do you think you are? You're not, you're not him. And you are to worship him. Let me read it again. Let the angels of God, the Father, worship him, Jesus. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits? In other words, who produces your souls? Spirits is lowercase, means their soul. This is, this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. <coughs> who, make, who makes his angels souls is the way you can read it. And his ministers a flame of fire. But... To the Son, that's Jesus, it's uppercase. He, God the Father, says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Hmm. This is going to be in Isaiah 44, 24, when he talks about how he's building stuff and who he is. This is prophecy. So God the Father, just called God the Son, Creator and God. So go back to John. So, God the Son just called God the Father God. See the correlation? God the Father called God the Son God. And God the Son called the Father God. Jesus was in human form. He was subject to the Father. Just like when God set up the family of a husband and a wife. Both equal. Both human. Both equal in the eyes of God. They both have jobs. The wife is to be uh, submissive to the husband, according to Ephesians chapter 5. But the husband has more responsibility. Well, Jesus is in subjection to the Father. He says that. The Holy Spirit's in subjection to the Son. And they're all three God, all three separate, all three the same. Again, I keep going over this, is it only makes sense if you have a triune God. Even in the Hebrew and in the Greek, the Trinity is not a problem. Okay, so let's keep reading. What verse was I on? Um, let me see. So where have you taken him? Okay. Verse 18. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same then then the same day that the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut. This is getting dark time on the sun on the first day of the week, which is sun, what we call Sunday. It says when the doors were shut, why does that why, why does it make a point of that the doors were shut? It means it's being it's secured. You're not gonna come in without somebody letting without somebody knowing. You're not gonna be able to just walk in. There's a reason. The doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear that the Jew of the Jews. And then Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Shalom. When he said this, when Jesus said, had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Okay. One of the things, uh, just for real quick, the piercing wasn't here because that would rip. It would rip because there's nothing there to hold on. In Greek, it'll, the, you have the uh, radius and the ulna, the bones that come here in the circle. There's a solid the bone that comes right here. Well, and all the nerves and tendons and everything, you know, when you smash your fingers, that hurts the worst. 
All those nerves come right up through here. <coughs> Excuse me. They would stick the pin right here. This is considered hand in the Greek. In the Koine Greek, that's hand. So this is part of the hand, so it's, it's accurate. They would shove it through there because it's more painful, plus you can hang on there, there's a bone there, so it wouldn't rip out. So when he's showing them his hands and his feet, he's showing them, saying, come here, look at this. And cool part, he's in his resurrection body. He showed up in a house that was locked. And he did that on purpose. And he didn't show up all bloody and ripped up and shredded because he'd just been late, pulled off the cross three days earlier. If he had just revived and rolled the stone away and went and got some water and some food and got past the, Rome, the 16 Roman soldiers that were there who all lost their life because he got out. Um, the, and then showed up three days later and he'd been ripped up to shreds. He wouldn't be looking all good. They would be saying, what's wrong with you? He had a resurrection body. He came into the house and he didn't have to use a door. He just showed up. That's an example of what we will have once we have a resurrection body. Okay, we'll also eat because he eats with them. Cool. We're going to have food. Okay, we don't have to worry about getting fat. Okay. Uh, don't have to count calories or, or cholesterol or whatever. Uh, I'm interested to find out what the food is when we get there. Um, the thing is, he said, look at my side. Because remember last week we were talking about how he was, the Roman guard stuck him in the side and blood and water came out? When you die, your blood's no longer, you no longer have red blood coming out. Once it settles, it separates the, the clear plasma and the red blood cells. Okay. Is it that easy? That is. Okay. My wife, it, she's done this for many years. She, she's a blood person. Um, <laughs> see, anyway, so the separation between the, the plasma and the blood. You can't do that if your heart's pumping and you're dead. See, the, the, the theories of, oh, he's really alive and they just came, no. They can't happen. Okay. He said, and come and stick your hands in my side. Um, Crud, I hate when I start getting off the chase the rabbit trail. Sorry about that. He showed, his, he showed them his hands and his side and then the disciples were glad and when they saw the Lord, verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Verse 22. And when he had said these, this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. This is Holy the, God, the Holy Spirit. Jesus just gave these men <clears throat> the Holy Spirit. The term in Hebrew is neshama, neshama. I'll, I'll, I'll write it up here. You remember when Adam, when God created Adam, Jesus created Adam, Jesus created Eve. When Adam was created out of the dust of the earth, that's why our the minerals and trace elements in our blood and our bodies is the same as the dirt. Um, it says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life the neshama, or the soul life. He cre God created a soul, which he just says he cre created the souls of the angels. Adam was the first human that he created a soul for a human and breathed into him. Well, Christ has the authority to breathe on them, and when he breathes life, it's more than just, it was more than soul life, because they already have souls, but now he's breathing into them eternal life. He's only through Jesus. He breathed into them, so the Holy Spirit takes up residence. You're not saved if you're not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. When you become saved, then you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit now. Okay? And he breathed on them and, the, and said to them to receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, And if you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain those sins of any, they are retained. Why did he wait till he gave them the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, if you remember, it's very clearly. Because people say, uh-oh, the apostles had the ability to forgive sins. So therefore, you have preachers or priests that can forgive sins. That's wrong. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Only God can forgive sins. He says that only he can forgive sins. So if somebody says, well, your sins are absolved, go do the, you know, say the, say a whole bunch of different chants. 
uh, if you'll go to Matthew uh, uh, chap Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, or Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. I'll, I'll put it up on here. It says, don't pray and chant like the unbelievers do because it's, it's, God doesn't like it. But what he's saying is, once you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to understand what sin is and what sin is not. You're going to be able to recognize it because the Holy Spirit's going to tell you. That's what he does in our body. He, like when we have a red flag in our heart when we're doing something, thinking something's not right. That's the Holy Spirit trying to get your attention. A small, still voice, that's the Holy Spirit. That's God, the Holy Spirit. These men didn't forgive sins. They said, what's the context here? And you can't find a commentator who says otherwise unless they can't read the Bible. He said, you will recognize what sin is. And you say, your sins are forgiven because you confessed them. And they'll be able to recognize, they knew how to recognize if they were truly saved, if they repented, if they confessed it to God, they would say, yes, you're saved, or no, you're not. They would be able to question them and say, yeah. Or if that person was lost, or if that person uh, had committed a sin and, and hadn't confessed it to God as a believer, then they had the authority to say, you're not forgiven. And God says, you're, you're, you're like a pastor is supposed to do, is tell you, if you want to be forgiven your sins, you confess it to God, but first you got to belong to him. You have, but if you if you commit a sin and you're still going out doing it and intentionally doing it and practicing it, then you're not forgiven. This isn't forgiving. The person's not forgiving the sin. It's recognizing what is and isn't forgiven because God tells us what it is. Okay, that's the context. Now Thomas, this is verse twenty-four. Now Thomas, doubting Thomas, <coughs> excuse me, called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came in. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. In other words, I don't care what you say. Uh -uh, this too, uh -uh, mm -mm. <laughs> That's why he's called Doubting Thomas to this day. Verse 26, this gets cool. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors were shut and he stood in their midst. Also, if you look in, in one of your versions, it'll say doors and windows. But the context is the same. Context is, is the house was secure. Okay, and it made a point to know that he can come, it, he, he can just, He's not required to knock on the door and have somebody open it. He just shows up because he has a resurrection body. He's leading by example. The door's being shut, and he stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be believing, unbelieving, but be believing. Now this my friends, this next verse, don't jump ahead. When we're saying, is Christ God? The Pharisees put him on the cross for claiming to be God. People worshiped him. He forgave sin, gave sight to the blind, claimed to be God. His apostles also called him God. So well, where does it say that? Verse 28. And Thomas, doubting Thomas, answered and said to him, Jesus, my Lord and my God. Now, I will say this. Um, when I have people very, very kind, very, very sincere people, very sincerely wrong, uh, my Jehovah Witness friends that show up to my door, which they will say, well, he's, they're saying he's having this interaction with Jesus, this personal interaction where he's, if he sees Jesus, he's going to be focused like on seeing a long lost relative, just only more intensified. That's the context. And he's going to be having this, and he's going to say, my Lord and my God, when he's talking to him. Some will say, well, he's going to go from here looking at Jesus, going, my Lord and my God. It's like, take uh, no, it, it's, it's not even, that's not even good grammar. That, that, no, because if, God, if Jesus wasn't God, he would have rebuked him. He didn't rebuke him, did he? Because if, if somebody calls you God, and you sit there and say, well, I guess I am. Look what happened to Herod's son. When he, the people were saying, oh, you're a God. He, said, well, he didn't rebuke them. 
And what happened is, as soon as he didn't rebuke them, he kind of just let it, he let it linger. God says, that's it. An angel came down and uh, cursed him, and he got eaten with worms right there on the spot. That's what God thinks. So if Jesus wasn't exactly who he says he was, and this is talking to Jesus, then he would have been he would have been uh, blaspheming, and he Jesus would have rebuked him if it was otherwise. But Jesus said this in verse twenty nine. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. <laughs> That's us. We're, we're his, other, it says, remember how he was talking about in uh, chapter 10 through 12 <coughs> when we were called sheep, where he said, my flock, I have other flocks that you don't need to know anything about. He said, and they're coming. He said, you don't know anything about it. There's no way you can. That's us. This is us for, until the end of time. Verse 30, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. In other words, he did more miracles and did a whole bunch of other stuff. You're thinking, how come it's not in here? Keep reading. Many others, many other, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may know and believe that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, or the Son of God. Son of God is a title, and that believing you may have life in his name. Okay, it also tells us that if we, if we were to write everything that happened that he did during that time, he said it would, it would fill the earth with books. There's just, he's, he's not using a term of physical, he, he's saying, He's giving a, trying to get a point across saying there was so much stuff that he did that they didn't write down, but they wrote down enough that we can see the miracles, see the evidence um, of, his, of his coming and of what he did. Okay, real quickly. Um, we are just, there is, Jesus is God. He's the creator of the entire universe. We know that. He came down and died for his creation. Came down in, in the image image of sinful flesh to die for his own creation. Went to a cross he didn't deserve to die for sins he didn't commit. And he literally moved heaven and earth to do it. The nails didn't hold him on the cross. The Romans didn't force him. Think about it. God the Son could, could have just thought and the entire population of the earth would have disappeared. He had that authority. He had that power. He thought the universe into existence. It wouldn't have been a tough choice to take this little piece of sand that we call Earth and, and make it gone. They stayed on the cross for us out of love, something we have no concept of exactly how big that is. Went and let him let us look in the last part of Isaiah, of Isaiah 52. Said so they, they beat him so bad he wouldn't he didn't even look like a human being anymore. Um, and then go through Isaiah 53 where they stuck him, and this is 700 years before he showed up. Talks about it as if it had already been in place. Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. I'll, I'll put it up here later. And was spit on and ridiculed and cursed at and beaten and stuck on a criminal's cross and died a horrible death. And somebody's going to say, well, and a religion's going to say, well, everybody's going to come to heaven because God died and paid for the sins of the world. Yes. Anyone who would accept. He said, if you don't accept, you don't have to accept what I've done. I've died for your sins. If you'll just accept them, you can have forgiveness. But if you don't, you don't have forgiveness. His words. But for someone to say, well, all you have to be is a good person, whether you be a Buddhist or Hindu or Muslim or, or anything or nothing, saying you just have to be a good person to go to heaven is completely against Scripture. John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody, nobody in the Greek means nobody comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say, well, unless you're a good person. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, he says, works don't save you. 
but it's a gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And I'll, I'll put that up here. So either Jesus is right or these latter-day churches are right. These heads of these churches, these mega churches, these monstrous religions that have been around for 1,500 years. You have a choice. You can believe what your church says. I don't care which church you go to, small, big, doesn't matter. They may, be, they may be teaching good gospel. Great, stay there, support it financially and helping and, and, and supporting your pastor and your, and your elders. But read your scripture because you're gonna be held accountable for it. God says, I came and died for the sins of the world and to say that you can just get to heaven on your own merit by doing your own thing, by going to going and paying for some of your own sins in a place called they call purgatory, which wasn't thought of till centuries after he came. Saying that you could pay for some of your own sin is to say he didn't die for all sin or didn't do it quite as good. God says, then you won't be with me because he said, either I did it all or I didn't do it. Or I did, either I did it all and you did nothing. All you have to do is accept the free gift I'm giving you. I did all the work. Only God could do that. And there's no human that we pray to. Because it says very clearly, and I'll put the verse up here. It says we, we have an advocate. We have a mediator. One, a singular mediator between God and man. And that is the man, Jesus Christ. Nobody else. There's no, there's no human. Mary is not someone we pray to. We can't pray to the saints. We can't pray to a human. We can't pray to a dead body. That some religions do. Um, because God says in the second commandment, you shall have no graven images before me. He says, you shall bow and worship me only. Only Christ could accept prayers. Only God, only Christ could forgive sins. To say that people can become deity or more than just human beings when we go to heaven because someone down here on earth uh, ramped it up is going completely against scripture. That's paganism. I don't care. Look at scripture. It tells you. Pick up the Bible and read it. Don't take my word for it. Don't, don't trust anybody. But trust that word. And you're saying, well, you're just, you're just intolerant. It's not my word. It's his. Jesus is the one who said there's only one way. Jesus says, I will not allow sin in my heaven. Not one. So if you're practicing sin, lying, he said all, all liars will have their place in the lake of fire, which burns forever. There's no death in hell. Uh, you live forever by yourself. All the billions of people that are going to be there are going to be there in their own little hell. You're not going to be able to see anybody. It's going to be completely pitch dark and painful. Why am I saying this? It's because I hope, it, I hope that it gets somebody's attention. Because it, we don't have much time left. I don't know how long that is, but I don't, I don't want to be guilty of your blood. If I did, I did, that means I wouldn't love you if I didn't say the truth. I don't want anything from you. Don't send money. Don't send information to me. If you want to speak with us, please contact us either by uh, pray5.org, which you'll see at the end of this video, or on this Facebook page right here, as long as they keep it up, or on my YouTube, which is going to be Cop for Christ, and then number seven. I'll put it up here, okay? And you'll see my smiling face. You'll see the, the symbol that you see of Christ stomping the head of the snake, of the serpent. You'll see that, that same you'll see that same picture on, on the YouTube site, so you'll know where you're at the right place. I did that on purpose. If you have any questions, call us. Um, Keep an eye on the news. Keep an eye on Israel, who is preparing, has, is, right now is <coughs> going through the largest military maneuvers in their history. And it says the plans are uh, practicing it as if they are going to attack Iran. It's not a coincidence, because they're telling Iran, if you get nuclear weapons, we're going to attack you and blow your stuff up. We know where it's at, and we know where it's coming from. Our country is having joint maneuvers with them. Kind of weird because our country's also given Iran the materials and the information trying to make the deal happen to get the nuclear weapons. 
and then we're going to turn in and bomb, help Israel bomb them. Okay, insanity. If you have had enough of this, you say I want I want Christ. Then go to the Father and say and repent. Say I've sinned against you. I can't save myself. I believe your Son, who is God the Son, came to this earth. He was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, was tempted in all areas, went to a cross he didn't deserve to die for sins he didn't commit, to shed his blood, God's blood, and to pay the price, to become sin for us. Paid the price for those sins with his own blood. God is the only one that came to us. All other religions, you got to go to him, and that's not God. He came down and took care of the problem himself. Died, went to the cross, or went to the grave, rose three days later, and came out and spoke to hundreds, and then ascended 40 days later, and is at the, and is at the, at the right hand of the Father. It's to accept him and ask him to save you from your sins, knowing who he is. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. He says, I am faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. That is for the believer, not the unbeliever. Till next week, we'll be on the very last one. We'll be on chapter 21. We'll finish that up, and then we will be going into Hebrews. We may take a week in between. I don't know yet. I'll, I'll announce it next week, and I'll post it. Again, the videos I was telling you about, uh, I will post them on, on this segment once I get it edited. Uh, and I'll leave it up long enough where you can get a picture of it, and you can find them. That's all on YouTube. The URL is on YouTube. I will not download the videos onto my site because I can't uh, for copyright reasons. But I can I can dang sure send you I can dang sure put the URL on there to their to go to their site. Okay. Father, thank you for this time together. We ask for your blessings, your mercy, and your grace. Please show us what to do to serve you. If we have something wrong in our heart, Father, that's not incorrect, that is wrong, please straighten us, correct us. Open our eyes to your truth. Save us, Father. And may you spread your gospel throughout our families and our jobs and our schools, our government. We ask that you would protect us from evil, physical danger, and illness. Protect and bless Israel. Evangelize her. We ask that you would send a great awakening through our country. But if not, Father, we will still serve you. It's in the name of our Messiah, Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Amen.